Hello everyone, and welcome to the 24th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. I hope you're all doing well. First of all, my name is Tanmay Bakshi. Thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Now before we begin today's show, I do want to start off by saying uh, that today is my uncle Mayur Batra's birthday. And so I hope you're having a great day. Uh, and everybody on the stream, please do join me in wishing him a very happy birthday. Now on today's show, we're being joined by someone that I've personally had so much fun with. Now every time we meet up, we end up, I mean of course, doing a lot of fun things. I've known him for a couple of years now, and every time we meet up, we also end up eating Krispy Kreme as a ritual. Um, and I learned so much from him as well, right, all the way down to a technology perspective. Um, so our special guest today is Mike Tibbs. He has 40 years of technical executive experience at a Fortune 1 company and is now the Director of Information Services at Shelter Insurance. Now we've got a jam-packed discussion ahead of us. We're going to go all the way from digital transformation and what it should really be called uh, to what young technologists should be learning or, or, or doing to be ready for the future. And so now, uh, any further ado, I'd love to welcome Mike to the show. Hi, Mike. How are you? Good morning, Tanmay. Good morning. Good morning from Arkansas. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great to finally have you on the show. You know, I, when we first met in Arkansas, it was, uh, it was really fun. There's so many things that we did, right, that I, that I, that I still remember. We, had, we, had so much, uh, we laughed so much that day. Um, and it's, it's great to finally have you on the show. It's an, it's an honor to have you on. Tanmay, we may be the only people that nearly got thrown out of Crystal Bridges Museum for laughing at a blank canvas. <laughs> I mean, what else are we supposed to do? <laughs> now, I remember uh, we were trying to be somewhat astute, but yeah. it wasn't successful. Yeah. I remember your mother walked up and said, "When this, it's a blank canvas. And he said, when are they going to put the picture in there? And then <laughs> I both just lost it. I mean, I, yeah, that was uh, that was incredibly funny. It's uh, this uh, this is amazing stuff. But you know, it was it was really fun having you uh, or being with you in Arkansas that day. And now it's really fun having you on the show virtually. Of course, it would have been even better if you could actually come to Toronto, since I've been to Arkansas and met you. But That's true. That's after true. COVID, we're we're gonna do that for sure. Yeah. But right, I mean, as I mentioned, it's 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 great to have you on the show. There's there's so much that I want to talk about today. You know, so much experience that I want to be able to, you know, um, learn from. And so before we start, actually, how about we start off with a quick introduction? Could you maybe tell the audience a little bit more about what you do and 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 what you're passionate about, what your what your journey's been like? Absolutely, I'll cover it quickly. I uh, was introduced to technology uh, early, at age eleven. I remember. Uh, have an opportunity to travel to the big town at that time of Bentonville, Arkansas. And uh, of a chance uh, happenstance, I had an opportunity to meet with Sam Walton, and most people heard of Sam Walton personally as a child. And uh, as it goes, I was escorted uh, through the halls at that time, a very small company. And I remember going into the computer room, he called it the computer room, which actually was a data entry area. Uh, tape drive storage. It was it was old school, and Sam was always infamous for not having any information technology at his. He had no keyboards. He had no screens. Everything was on paper. But he did understand the importance of technology. He said, "I don't know what they do in here, but this will make us great." And from that day, I had been motivated to be a technologist. Uh, from there, I had an opportunity to work for that company for a number of years, as you stated. Uh, my degree is computer science. I uh, went to Arkansas State University. I've had the opportunity to work both in the uh, technology development side, the infrastructure side, a lot of infrastructure side, building data centers. <clears throat> I worked uh, a stint in security, data security, mainly focusing on compliance, Har Sarbanes-Oxley and HIPAA and PCI. I had hair when I started that, so <laughs> you know, that, that was an intense situation. And uh, just had an opportunity to work across manufacturing in several areas. So I, I really have enjoyed the trip and I think it's just begun. That is so, so amazing to hear, you know, you've had this incredible journey starting all the way from, you know, back, uh, back, back when you sort of, when, when, when this company was smaller, all the way to, you know, when, when it was Fortune One, being able to see that transformation, I think is incredible because it's not just a long time. It goes from a small scale to a very large scale, right? And, and I feel like there's so much transformation you see just over time and over scale at that same time uh, that I think is, that I think is really unique. 
as a matter of fact, because you've had you know such a such a long career in in the world of technology, one thing that I'm wondering is, from your perspective, what do you think the most impactful technologies you've sort of worked with or that you've advanced have been? Right. So like. I, for example, have, have worked with a couple of, I mean, of course, my career's nowhere near as long as yours yet, but, but you know, I, I've worked with a couple different technologies, and, and I personally am most fascinated by, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, because I'm like, you know, we have all this data, now we can finally start to use it with the power of machine learning. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of my perspective with what I've seen. What do you think? What are the most impactful technologies that you've advanced or you've worked with in, in your career? Well, Tan, may I will say that you've got an advantage over me because you had a start farther down the technology path. Remember when I started, technology was uh, at best something in locked rooms behind doors uh, with individuals who are fed pizza under the door and it's <laughs> running a mainframe beehive terminal, uh, which, uh, which, you know, development was done on when I initially started. I took a class in card punch. Yes, that's way back. Now, obviously that is, that's antique beyond antique. But, but when we talk about technology that actually has really impressed me, uh, Believe it or not, we were I had an opportunity to work with some of the first wireless technologies. And at the time before that, everything was physically wired. And that sounds low right now, everything's wireless. But to have an opportunity to to send transmission through wireless was an amazing transformation for the company. Uh, another one which may surprise you, which is so commonplace now, is the concept of barcode scanning. Now that sounds like something I mean, children run it now. Yeah. But at the concept of a laser, a spread beam laser actually reflecting the white spaces between the black spaces and, and identifying the item uh, was small, but it wasn't surprising enough. It wasn't designed just to uh, speed the checkout. That was actually a side item. The real reason was unable to replenish. Uh, so that data is shared with uh, individuals, not only in the manufacturing side, but also to the raw material side for them to manufacture raw materials to generate the product because we take it for granted. We think that in the supply of, to surprise you, toilet paper. There is not <laughs> in the supply of toilet paper and we've proven that. So the concept of being able to demonstrate rate of flow and how things work and how things sell, the objective of retailers and most companies is to sell the last item just as the new items come in. You don't own it till you need it. And sometimes you can actually sell it before you actually buy it mm -hmm. as, a, as a company. So. Those are two. It goes well beyond that. <clears throat> uh, the concept of going to microsystems. I'll tell you a quick story. And this is out of the mouth of babes. You may have heard that conversation before. Uh, I have uh, several grandchildren. I have six. Uh, actually, I will soon have seven, but I have six right now. The first one, she's now 15. When she was much younger, she came to my office here at my home and uh, had, I thought, a pretty elaborate setup, as you like the technology is always proud of the technology you know a quad core system tower system setting in my office here 32 inch high definition screens with multiple surround sound i mean i, I was doing video editing for fun so i convinced myself knew this high-end technology and she asked me this as a young child can i play on your computer and i said well, you're welcome to work on it i don't have any games on that computer but you're so she sat down and she immediately bypassed the keyboard <laughs> and went straight to poking the screen and I said, uh, Lily, that's not a touchscreen. And her quote to me is stuck with me. She goes, then why do you have it? <laughs> because one of the advancements I think about that has just been so transformational is a concept of microsystems. You have one now, your parents have one, everybody has one, children have them, iPhones or some type of uh, smartphone system, which think about what that's gaining to us, touchscreen technology, no button technology, total uh, software defined infrastructure. I mean, the whole package is there. And those technologies continue to add just tremendous strengths to the human condition. So uh, that's some of the technologies I see that are advancing at very quick pace. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming next. Yeah, I can, you know, I never thought about it that way, right? There, there's so much stuff that, that we gain from these technologies that we that we don't even necessarily immediately realize, right? There's so much actually that we just generally do as humans that we don't realize we do and that, that we don't realize that we, we, we innovate from. Like for, like, for example, if it weren't for the International Space Station, we wouldn't have inventions as simple as Velcro, <laughs> right? right. And, and, and we think, you know, why are we investing so much in things like space exploration if we can't do X on Earth, right? People have these sorts right. of arguments, but it's like, 
we don't realize just how much we innovate by doing things that are seemingly unrelated, right? What you mentioned around mobile computing, right? If you take a look at uh, the new Apple A14, it's literally the fact that we want to be able to put as much compute power as physically possible on a mobile device that is forcing us to invent new ways of fabricating chips, right? These are going to be the first processors with a five nanometer process. Right. Not even Intel and AMD have done that yet. And that's because, well, they have a greater you know, thermal envelope that they can work with, they can take more power, but on mobile you've got to keep pushing until you can get as much performance out of every last drop of power on the device, right? Um, mm -hmm. Another thing you mentioned about wireless, right? Nowadays everything's wireless and that's enabled us to do so much. And I remember actually, if you go back um, in, in Reddit history by about a couple of years, back to when the AirPods were first announced, um, you, you can actually see all the comments from different people being like, oh, AirPods, that's a completely dumb idea. Why would anyone want completely wireless headphones? They look stupid, right? And, and people were just like, they hated the idea. Fast forward two years, almost all phones have removed the headphone jack. Everybody's transitioned to fully wireless. So, you know, it's, it's little things that we don't realize are going to be, you know, industry changing, but actually are. And it's, it's incredible to see, and it, I mean, I'm sure that you've actually seen a lot of this, not just from the consumer standpoint that I just mentioned, but even from an enterprise standpoint, um, as, you've been, um, as you've been working throughout your career. So Tan may think about this. Yes. Let's get really far out there, because I think the strengths of the technologist doesn't fall in utilizing existing tools, but developing the tools of the future that actually make the impossible possible yes that's a quote i'll talk about in person in a moment right. but let's think about this you talked about jamming all the technology into a small mobile device i've got one right here yes okay yes. uh which is very powerful imagine the concept of as wireless advances 5g's coming to everywhere i'm wondering what's next after that the speeds will be impeccable unbelievable uncontrollable instead of putting the compute on your device put the compute power in a larger storage, can you imagine having a handheld device that runs in petaflops? That would be, that that's the dream. That's the dream right, right. there. Right. <laughs> why, why limit ourselves? We talk about the most powerful computer known to humans is between your ears. Yes, that, so, that's, that's a good quote. So if that's the case, continue to mimic that environment by not just locking it in because the human mind utilizes not only the intelligence that has within it, but it knows to reach out. And the concept of being able at speed, be able to bring and retract information at speed, I think is gonna be something that revolution. revolution that, is, is. That, is, that is exceptional, right? That, that, I think you're absolutely right. That, that's where the industry is heading in the future. We've already seen examples like Google Stadia, right? Nowadays, instead of, well, this isn't that widespread yet because it requires like a really, really good internet connection. But again, as we slowly start to see more and more people get access to more and more reliable and, and fast internet, um, we're going to start to see things like Google Stadia and paper space sort of take off. And you know, nowadays yeah. people, are, people are already starting to replace buying a gaming computer with just renting a gaming computer in the cloud. Right? Why right. buy an RTX 3080 if you could just rent a Quadro in the cloud? <laughs> right? When it's, you need it. Just oh, when you need it. Exactly. That is... It's the Uber of technology. Yes, yes. Oh, Only being it, able to pay for something it, when you need it. When you absolutely need it. And that way you use the power when you need it. It's available, but it's not when it's not. It's the turbo button on your computer. Yeah, it goes way back, by the way. <laughs> I always thought, why did I have a turbo button? Just leave it on all the time. Yeah. But, but uh, it was interesting. Those type of technologies have advanced to the point to where we realize true strength falls into a collaboration. Yeah. So. True strength is in collaboration. That's that's a good way to think about it. It's kind of like taking what cloud has done for business and transforming that to a consumer level as well, almost. Okay. Right. So right now at a consumer level, we kind of limit ourselves to thinking about a cloud as like data storage. Right. Whenever you were to go to somebody that doesn't work in like tech and you say cloud, they think, oh, iCloud, data storage for my photos. Right. That sort of thing. Um, right. But imagine being able to have compute in the cloud. That's that that's really the dream. Um, of course, though, that's going to require a lot of infrastructure changes as well, right? So we're going to need a lot more people to be actually connected to the Internet. What are your thoughts on that? Have you seen any interesting initiatives? What do you think about the sort of the, the challenge of actually getting people connected to the Internet itself? Well, you think about it, Tanway. We're actually necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. Uh, and with the most recent onslaught, onslaught of COVID, uh, individuals in order to maintain productive, not only productive, but also linked to human beings, 
have found technology collaboration is the right answer. You and I are experiencing it right now. Mm -hmm. Just how many years ago, Tanmay, was this type of collaboration a thing of of of, of science fiction? And mm -hmm. and now it's just commonplace. I mean, we're talking about children learning remotely, still learning, but learning remotely. Businesses learning remotely, being safe but able to be successful. I think that we need to understand that we have to be empowered using whatever tools we have. So as far as the internet, internet's just another tool in the mix. Uh, I think that as the speeds continue to increase and we're able to get density of that, of the high speed connections across the country and across the world, uh, we're finding out that we can expand our horizons. We talk about being collaborative. This allows us to be collaborative on a global scale. A connected human uh, group is much more powerful than a single. So yeah. I'm actually starting to see it being very commonplace. People who traditionally weren't even involved in technology at all, except, you know, to turn on and downstream a movie, okay, have now suddenly become extremely capable because of the simplistic section, sec ability to connect to technology. We talk about, I'll say it again, smartphones. You can hand a smartphone to a five-year-old. <laughs> And in a matter of moments, they're actually doing it. We are, we're amazed by that, but we realize it was built to be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first began in being a technologist, technology was something you had to have some extreme level of education or, or uh, instruction to do something simple. Now the simple is press a button, it'll walk you through it. If you don't understand, watch the video, it'll show it to you. Uh, and I think that's where we need to continue to pass. And let's not build things that are complicated. Let's build the complicated and make it easy to the user. Wow, that is, uh, you're right. I think we take for granted just how simple technology is to use today, right? And if you take a look mm -hmm. at, at what enables technology to be that simple, at the end of the day, I feel like it's the developers actually building that technology, making it that simple to use. And, and what's so interesting about tech is that developers are able to sort of build on top of everything that they do and, and continuously make every part of the stack simpler, right? Even developing apps for an iPhone is simpler today than it was, you know, five years ago. And, and those apps are now able to be simpler for users to use, right? And a good example that I think, and not, I don't think enough people pay attention to this sort of thing, is um, compiler technology, right? It, it's something that I'm really fascinated by and actually a great example from just yesterday. Um, I was implementing an application, uh, which is something that actually I'm going to release soon, so I, it's, 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 it's an interesting app. One of the functions was a pretty simple, you know, clockwise rotate of a point about another point in a certain grid, right? Pretty simple standard stuff. For the counterclockwise rotate, I decided to do something that doesn't necessarily make that much sense because it's a simple algorithm, but, you know, for the sake of discussion. For the counterclockwise rotate, instead of just negating the signs and doing a counterclockwise rotate that way, I did a clockwise rotate three times for a single counterclockwise rotate, all right? Now, the reason I did that was because I was then able to use the Godbolt Compiler Explorer, which lets you see what translates to assembly. And what LLVM had done, and this was in Swift too, not even in C, this was in Swift. What LLVM had done is it had taken the loop where I did four I and one to three, unrolled it to, th to, to actually three separate calls. Then it took each function call for the clockwise rotate and inlined the function and then simplified all the arithmetic down to a simple counterclockwise rotate. Right. So if you can imagine what's happening there is because the compiler is doing all that heavy lifting for me, as a developer, I'm free to go ahead and implement things that are going to make my users happy, which, are going to, which is going to make my application simpler to use and better. And then from there, a better experience throughout the whole stack. So things at the very bottom affect everything on top. Right, so I feel like maybe we don't give that enough, enough credit, in my opinion. Well, I'll tell you, Tanmay, I'll, I'll go way back. Uh, I was given the opportunity to do some development in COBOL. Yes, COBOL is still an active blank language. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit wordy, uh, but it's one. Of, it was actually I was told by an instructor it should be so elegant. The word elegant, I love the word elegant when developing code. Yeah. Uh, was to if I'm in the middle of developing an application and pass out and fall into the floor. Someone could slide into my seat and never miss a lick and keep moving forward. But the opportunity was was to get, uh, it's, is to develop an application. They gave us three weeks, by the way, three weeks to singular develop an application using the code, any rules we wanted, anything legal, you understand. <laughs> don't break any guidances, don't break any rules, don't break any, you know, laws. Uh, but 
develop something that would allow us to continue on this path of selling, in this case, real estate. Uh, so I was, it, was not, it was an assignment by a professor, and I went through, the, and I said, can I use anything at my disposal? And the professor said, yes. I said, okay. So people, and that you can pair off the people, you can do it individually, collectively, makes a difference. So my thought was, I'll go to the, in this case, the computer lab. And I, my first query was to run a query search on anybody in, that had already written something in this. And I wanted to see what they'd done. And the first one that came up was a public file that was written by the professor, just assigned it to me. They had done it as a master's student and they had published that particular application uh, for a grade. So I took it <laughs> and I told them I did. And I was the only student in that group that actually thought the idea, go find it already written, which by the way, is a foundational part of development. Build on the strength of others. Don't yeah. try to recreate the wheel every time you touch it. You're doing it now. You're building on the strength of individuals that have built technologies over the past. Uh, don't be afraid. You don't have to build your whole car. Just drive the car and make it better. <laughs> this constant strength of making things better. Also, I want you to go way out of the box. Uh, if you do things using only the attributes of tool sets we have today, then you're just working with what you have today. You're improving it, but you're not making those big leaps. So I was in a I was in a gathering of individuals in which we we're talking about this very complicated tool we needed to create. And uh, and I and they said you can use anything you want, same scenario, even use languages not yet created. Bad answer. So I actually at the end of this discussion, I took a piece of paper, I drew a circle, wrote the word do it on it, and handed in. I said, build that. <laughs> what is it? I said, it's a do it button. Whatever you ask, do it. Now, it's interesting. Tanmay, you're doing that now. Because the inset of the development of natural language communication with the technology, which is still in its infancy, it's much better, but it's still in its infancy, will revolutionize technologist capabilities. Instead of like my granddaughter bypassing the keyboard, you're actually having a conversation with something to get something done. Right now, it's can you do this for me? In the future, it says, can you build this for me? Yes. So. And I think we're already starting to see that future. First of all, there are so many really interesting things you said there, right? So I want to sort of break this apart. First of all, what you mentioned around um, building upon what developers have already done. I think that is so critical, right? We, we, we cannot be reinventing the wheel. Fundamentally, I feel like we as humans, we've um, we've innovated so much over such such a short time span that if we sit back and reinvent the, the wheel every couple of years, we're going to get nowhere, right? We have to continuously build off of what's already been built, right? Otherwise, we're, gonna, we're never going to have time to innovate. And I, and I feel like when we work together, we end up building things that are just so much better, right? Like if you take a look, companies like um, like, like like IBM or Microsoft uh, up until a couple of years ago usually use proprietary solutions for things like machine learning and deep learning. Their own like custom, you know, uh, custom built like deep learning frameworks that use the GPU and accelerators like that. And then eventually they realized, you know, we're spending so much money trying to develop these frameworks but they're still inferior to TensorFlow just because TensorFlow is open source and has thousands of people working on it, right? And then you take a look at Windows, right? What are some of the most common things that people don't like about Windows? Right. They, most of them have to do with the developer tools. And that's because right. Windows is great, but the platform it's built on isn't, <laughs> right? The, the DOS platform, the kernel that it's been to, built on, the Windows NT kernel is not that well designed right so there's there the, because it was fundamentally trying to reinvent the wheel you already had bsd mock kernels these sorts of things right. and apple decided well we want to have a lot of custom stuff so sure we can build a custom user space but why not use the mock and bsd kernels that already exist and just merge right. them into one right so so it, it's it's all about being able to say all right this already exists we don't need to reinvent this even if this needs to be open source we don't need to redo this, right? We can just build on top of it and do amazing things, right? Now we've got the sort of best of both worlds where you've got a, a great custom, you know, you got all the advantages of a proprietary operating system with Mac OS, but all the advantages of an open source base, Darwin. So right. and then Linux is taking that to the next level further. Every enterprise is powered by Linux because it's entirely open source. Right, right. And, you know, natural language, what you mentioned about that, 
natural language has always been, you know, a passion of mine. As a matter of fact, I, I can't say too much about this yet, but next week on Tech Life Skills, we've got some really interesting natural language stuff coming up. But yeah, I mean, natural language has always been a, an area of interest for me because language is how we communicate. Language is how we talk to each other. We, 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 we take arbitrary thoughts, even ones that we've imagined, ones that we haven't concretely experienced, and we're able to, to serialize these thoughts into words, right? And, and we're able to communicate with our devices today in those words. And, you know, I, I feel like the future is coming in the sense that we already have systems like OpenAI's GPT-3 that can help us generate code. Like you can describe the Google homepage and it generates the right JavaScript code to, 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 to go ahead and, and render a page like that. Now, I will say people are kind of hyping that technology a bit too much. Um, it's not going to replace coders uh, anytime soon because, you know, no. I feel like at the end of the day, code is an art, right? It's it's not a science. It's not an analytical thing where, you, you know, I want to implement this. This is the exact plan for how this will be implemented. It really is an art. There's a thought and you go and you paint your code, like you, you write your code like art. Um, it, it requires creativity fundamentally, right? It requires problem solving skills that these neural networks don't have because, they weren't trained to have them. Like the math that we're using fundamentally is lazy. It doesn't want to do, well, I use want because that's a limitation of language, right? I'm mean, sort of humanizing the network here, but really what we mean is mathematically there's no incentive for it to learn any kind of common sense reasoning or things like this. So, you know, there, there are limitations. Sorry? Yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, yeah, <laughs> a little legal fine print yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, that's um. I, I love what you mentioned there. There there's so much to to think about. So if you think about this, Tammy, I want you to consider. Many times we catch ourselves trying to digitize the manual processes and old processes we always had. And what I'm saying, instead of manually recreating that function, try a way to automate it make it to where that's no longer needed to be done. You talked about, you had, I'm gonna use some old, old developer language, you had a module pre-built that formed a function. You simply adapted that module to perform the new function. Mm -hmm. Right, you made it simple, mm -hmm. you made it easy, you made it standardized. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm scared, the first vehicles, the first cars that came out actually looked like buggies without the horse. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's funny. We oftentimes lock ourselves. I'll say this a lot. We lock ourselves into these standardized functionalities because that's all we have. When we don't realize we have the opportunity to create something more. Uh, right now, it's all series of zeros and ones. And one of the question, what if we add a two? <laughs> you know, now you've got three stasis and, and, and those type of scenarios. And, so, and you say, well, Mike, that language not even developed. Right. Because someone probably right now is developing the next level of intelligent thinking. Natural language will help do that because it makes it real. Uh, the days of keyboards are probably numbered. And I took classes in keyboarding and you're like me, you're very fast in keyboard, but I can talk faster than I could ever type. Mm -hmm. So, and I can communicate better because the language inflection means something. I'm gonna, my wife's an English teacher, has been teaching for 30, over 30 years. So if I was to say the sentence, Let's eat, Grandma. But I hadn't put the pause in there and said, "Let's eat, Grandma." <laughs> two totally different things. <laughs> you have to be able to make language real. Also, I've been so impressed with the technologies coming out from companies now, to where I have had open discussions with what I thought was a person, but I caught along the way, "You're not real, are you?" <laughs> and I think we got to get to the point to where language with a technology is so simplistic and it's so natural. It's interesting. I've heard a story that said what we all learned technology was all started in Star Trek. Now, I know that's funny, but they were talking to computers in the 60s. We just haven't totally developed that methodology yet. So I'm impressed. Please be pressing that button forward. <laughs> Thank you. Eh? That's that's definitely that's definitely what I'm going to do, right? That that's always been my interest, uh, pushing technology forward and, and really seeing what we can do, especially with language, because that's always been sort of that. You know, I, actually, that entire interest started with me watching Watson play Jeopardy, right? Because being able to think, mm -hmm. hey, machines can comprehend that language. That's such an intrinsically human thing, is is just amazing to me, right? And I feel like today. We have the fundamental limitation that uh, actually, you know, 
not even limitation, the fact that we can understand language very well, but we can't generate it really well. That's an right. issue, right? We can't write with computers. They can learn to read, but not to write because writing requires creativity. And that's something that they simply don't have. Great example, actually. They're, um, when it comes to Google Translate, which is really good nowadays, like up until a couple of years ago, I remember back when I was in like regular school um, and, and I, had a, I had a French teacher, um, she was like, you know, you should never use Google Translate because I can tell if you use Google Translate because the word order is going to be messed up. And, and nowadays we've got these super complex, deep neural machine translation systems that are, you know, writing really, really realistic sentences, oftentimes better than a human translator, right? Not in all cases, not in the edge cases, but in the common case, it's really, really good. Now, the way these systems work without getting into too much detail is there's an encoder and a decoder, right? So there's an encoder that takes your language, represents it mathematically, a decoder that auto-regressively, so word by word, goes ahead and generates the, the output uh, language. Now, these decoders are really good. Like, they, they create some exceptional language, right? They can translate metaphors, but then, the way that we generate language today with systems like OpenAI's GPT-2 is by using just the decoder on its own. So you remove the encoder and you just have a decoder just word by word generating text. And these decoders are terrible, right? They'll tell you it's sunny outside and then it's raining the next word, right? And that's because they were only trained to predict the next word. They don't care about meaning. They're not creative. They don't have any thought to base their language off of. Whereas when you have an encoder plus decoder, you've already done the thinking. You have the thought that's represented in the language that the decoder is then going ahead and generating more language for. But just the decoder on itself has no thought to work off of, right? Nothing to, to, to condition against and be like, all right, this is what I'm trying to generate, right? When we speak as humans, as I'm speaking, I'm not just predicting the next word based off of everything I've said. I have a thought in my mind and I'm serializing it word by word, right? right? So, so we have some limitations today. But these are things researchers are working on fixing, and I'm working on fixing as well. It's something that I'm really interested in. So, and we won't go too much on, on language decoding. Yeah. I will tell you, just consider the concept, how does a human learn language? See, That's... and you make the assumption that it is all learned in one pass. And by the way, everyone learns it differently. Uh, that's why you have a different dialect than me. That's why you may say things differently than me, because your thought process, the way you communicate that thought is different than me. But if we build a technology that understands that, a way that individuals, a system can, here's my thought, let me recalculate that. Uh, I, my son is learning Japanese, mm -hmm. okay? And Japanese not only has different ways of thinking, it's different ways of talking, it's in a different order. Mm -hmm. You know, we're noun, verb, subject, and it may be totally reversed from that, all the way down to how you're actually indicated. He, he explains to me that whether you're, and you have people on here that speak Japanese, uh, you know, that how you say something depends on who you're talking to. Yes. And it's interesting how that is. But uh, what I want you to consider is as people move down this path, I'm changing subjects a little bit. As you move down this path, technologists have to be cautious not to do technology just for technology's sake. Uh, it will be short lived. And I think you're going to have to add something that adds value, not only to, in some cases, business, in some cases, to improving the human condition. Uh, and a technology understands how to get things completed uh, with a business ROI, for example, return on investment, or uh, they understand risk monetization, where you can say the risk of doing this or not doing this is this, okay? And you can state that, and you have a measured in-state improvement uh, with a, is, there a, a technology that understands those items is a very powerful tool for change because that means they're not only uh, going to get the technology in place, it's going to have life well after them because people see the value of those items. And that's where like natural language is going to make a big difference. Wow. By the way, that's not the cool part of technology. <laughs> that's the part that makes the cool part possible. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a fun to think about, right? Because actually, I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that because I want to know from your perspective how technologists can think that way. But really quickly, one thing that I want to mention, there are a couple <laughs> of really good examples, in my opinion, of value-driven innovation being so much more meaningful than just innovation for the sake of innovation, right? Um, good example, let's just take a look at, um, say, even even Watson playing Jeopardy, right? 
back when Watson couldn't play, back when, you know, no computer system existed to play Jeopardy. If, if IBM were to say, all right, we want to advance the state of the art in question answering, and they didn't really have a goal for it, how far could they really have reached? Right? What could they have really done without that North Star metric of we want to play Jeopardy? And then with that North Star metric, they were able to invent brand new language comprehension technologies that we still use to this day as state of the art in order to be able to play Jeopardy. Right? That, that, that North Star, that value that they wanted to add was always clear to them. And as Steve Jobs said, for example, um, back, when, back when Apple invented some of the first laser printers on the, on the market, that when, when they develop these sorts of things, they don't think about, all right, what are some amazing things that our researchers have done and how can we turn them into a product, but rather, what is an amazing product that we can make? Right? What is some value that we can add to our, to our customers' lives? And now, how can we have our researchers work towards that goal? And on the way, you end up innovating so much, you don't even realize it, right? And, and, and same thing with so many examples, right? Chris Latner's over here thinking, how can we create a better compiler so that, or not even better compiler, how can we have developers write better code so they can write better apps? And, there, and, and then, of course, the answer is with a better compiler, right? So, so there, there's so many examples of this. And I, and I sort of want to ask you, how would you recommend that a technologist go from thinking, here's some really interesting tech I want to work on, to thinking, here's some value that I want to add. How can I implement tech here? How, how do you change that mindset? You know, it's going to be, it's almost a force because you have to step outside of your comfort zone. Uh, I was a trained technologist and still consider myself a technologist, but I also consider myself a humanist. So what I'd recommend is, you need to find ways to do things that you're not comfortable doing. Uh, example, how many trained technologists here have taken a class in finance, even though finance is required to make technology real? Uh, how many people here, and I will tell you, traditionally, most deep technologists, you're not this way, by the way, are a little bit introverted. Uh, well, introverts have their strengths, of course, experts have their strengths, but put them together individual who is highly technical, but can explain processes with vigor and excitement will bring much more people to the table than someone who doesn't. So I'm saying how many people here have taken an opportunity to be part of Toastmasters or to be part of an environment that puts you in a position that you're going to do things you're not used to doing. So what I'd recommend is find people that and take classes and do things that help you learn to build tools in your toolbox. I'm gonna to talk about tools for a moment. Many people have a toolbox. Uh, they have screwdrivers, hammers, wire pliers, and various tools across. And my wife says, I have a tool building because I cut tools. Uh, but I will tell you that just because you get a hammer, you don't throw the screwdriver away. Yeah. So, and I'm saying the same thing with your, your, your education and your, uh, your influencers. Be in a constant search for some way to give you different perspectives about the way things are done. I've heard people say, what problem are you trying to solve? And I say, it's not broken. We just want to make it better. You know, there was nothing wrong with this technology the way it was, but can we make it better? Can we improve the human condition? I'll give you a, a, an example. One of the influencers that I was able to gather in my career was purely by accident. I wouldn't have met this person except through business. And I'd recommend anybody who wants to study, you can look him up. His name is Mick Ebling, E B E. E-B-E-L-I-N-G. And he uh, started the Not Impossible uh, movement. He actually has a book called Not Impossible in which he has a whole new way of thinking. And I, I've always worked through the process, find what I want to do, build the model. And even though I was working through ag Agile, you still had an end state. You talk about having an end state, something at the end you want to land on. Mm -hmm. His was find what you do first, commit to doing it, and then figure out how. <laughs> Now that's different than most people. Most people want to have a plan and a mix and a schedule and a program model and, and then you do your modeling and you adjust along the way. His answer was find something extremely difficult that people think is impossible and then make it possible. If, if I can just quickly interject, that is that is exactly what I'm talking about with that IBM Research Grand Challenge model. We want to build a computer that can play Jeopardy. That was, that was utterly you you would you would be crazy if you said that before 2011 right now we want to make a machine that can debate against professional humans and win 
six years ago, you'd be crazy if you said that. But yeah, please go ahead and continue. Well, and that's why I tell people, don't consider going off-road, mm -hmm. uh, off-road technology. If you think about it, most people have no, they spend their entire careers or lives staying on the roads pre-established. From time to time, you, need, you have to stay on those to stay in business and stay moving. The concept is, I'm saying is, consider going off-road. Spend part of your time thinking about the commonalities of business, the commonality of people. What issues do we need to overcome? What things could we improve? What is the daily activities that people perform? What can we actually make better today? Example, uh, you're seeing dramatic improvements in collaborative tools, okay? I think this is Zoom. Uh, we use Teams. There's a thousand other tools like this. But what is inherently wrong with these tools? Uh, well, it does allow for the human connection, but it does allow for a deep understanding of that person. Would you also be able to include technologies that state what experience that person has? They could put secondary items about pre-notifications of their knowledge base. It could say, how can I give you what I have so that you can take it and give me what you have so I can use it? Mm -hmm. I think that's gonna be the next step is how to build that model. Uh, Right now, it's person to person. What if we put a third person in here that is a technology? A third person, which is not a person. Yeah. And the natural language we're having is being interpreted by that person, which is a non-person. Uh, it's artificial intelligence, which does in the background builds that, not that model for us as we start describing what we want. Uh, automate the impossible. So Mick has actually got a program now talking about human, human condition he actually has found a way to take restaurants that have excess food, take the donations of people and feed the hungry by telling them the restaurants in their areas that are donating food for them to go get it. Uh, and since it is extra food, it's at a lower price. So he's getting a great value for the donators, but it's being fed to people who are truly hungry all through technology. This would never been thought of before. His answer wasn't, let me do this. It is, I want to feed the hungry. Wow. I'm going to quickly say here that that last example that you gave, I feel like as technologists, you know, if you're if you're a really deep sort of technologist, and as you mentioned, you're sort of within that box of thinking of tech, you're like, sure, but where's the innovation in that in the sense of what did you invent in terms of technology to do that? All you did was stitch together a, a GPS API and you put together a little database and a back end and a front end and you're good to go, right? Where did you innovate? But I feel like as technologists, maybe it's important to realize, and, and I feel like all technologists fall victim to this, you know, occasionally all fall victim to this, everybody does, right? It, it, it's sort of natural. You think, but where is where was the innovation in that? But then you realize that, well, the innovation was in the value that it provided, right? Nobody else was doing something like this. Now they are, and it's adding value to human lives. The innovation isn't in the fact that there's better technology to power this. The innovation is in the value that it adds to human lives. Right, and if that requires brand new technology to do, great. Right, Netflix. Why is why is Netflix so innovative? Why is Netflix still the biggest streaming platform today? Even though they might, this is subjective. Even though they might not be the best streaming platform, it's because well, they had a technical lead. Right, they invented the technology for streaming content way before anybody else. So right. they also had a huge lead in developing their own content and getting a better catalog. And just right. that lead has been enough for them to continue be by far the largest, right? Even though companies like Apple are, like an example I used to give, right? How is Spotify still so big today, even if there's Apple Music, and even if Apple Music is so much more well integrated with every other product? There are even features that Apple Music doesn't have that, uh, sorry, sorry, Apple Music does have that Spotify doesn't like time sync lyrics. It's because Spotify personalizes the experience with the best recommendations in the industry because they have the most data. Similarly, again, why is Netflix so big even with things like Apple TV Plus and Disney Plus right, right, and Prime, right. right? There's so many examples. It's because of the fact that, well, they had the technical lead. They were able to innovate. And so that added so much value to people's lives that now they are, they're, they're the biggest, right? So I feel like technologists fall, fall victim to this, but you know, it, it's something that you've got to really think, how, how are we adding value to people's lives, right? As you mentioned, exactly. How are we improving the human condition? So Tanmay, if you consider down that path, you ask the question, how can a technologist improve that skill set? Mm -hmm. Then you need to understand the human condition. See, you can lock yourself in a position to where you learn another language, computer language. You may learn another platform. You may learn another concept. 
and you'll be very proficient in those capabilities. But you'll only build because remember the brain is the most complex, most power technologies we have. Uh, you'll only build in your scope of knowledge. I'm saying build that list of influencers, the end people, and you've done a great, I've, I've watched some of you, you call them your mentors. You don't realize you're actually mentoring as much as you're getting mentored. But build those influencers because you and I have totally separate backgrounds. I mean, I mean, totally separate backgrounds. But what a wonderful opportunity to learn from each other because we're both, we both gain value. So I'm saying find people who don't, this is my one of the items I would give technologists a little bit of advice, find people that don't have the same background as you. Search them out. Uh, they may tell you what you need to know or may tell you what you don't need to do or do need to do. But the concept is the more you add to that, the larger your toolbox becomes. And now you can start applying technologies that make a difference. More than just uh, it's cool, it adds value. Uh, you and I have talked about here about the te values being added. Imagine at the speed technology is being developed today. Uh, and we don't know we're even doing it in some cases. I, my son went to the Air Force Academy, a beautiful place. Uh, it's interesting. I went there and I was actually taken back by the beauty. If you've ever been there, it's at the foot of Pikes Peak. Uh, the background is just mountain breathtaking. It's just, it's a gorgeous place. When I asked him about it, he says he never even noticed because sometimes you're so the if you if you're in it all the time your paradigms are such a way that you recognize that is the norm i'm asking people to spread out and start saying what can we learn that we don't know today don't make a technology as i said learn from accountants learn from speakers learn from people who do whatever job they do or have a function out they always do and from that the technology will add value because that's where you want to be. Mm -hmm. I feel there, there's so many examples I could give here. I'm just going to give one, actually, because I feel like it's the most meaningful. There was a, an actual project I was working on, um, actually, at, at IBM around compiler tooling. Um, and, it, well, actually, the project wasn't compiler tooling. The project's goal was simple. How can we have people working on this internal project with tens of millions of lines of code? How can we have them write code more efficiently? Simple. Right. That, that, was, that was the goal. And the first thing that I did before we even thought about, you know, what technology stack we're going to use, people, you know, I will say a couple other folks on the team had already come up with this whole like idea, oh, we're going to use, you know, we're, we're going to do a static call trace of the code and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But I was like, hold on, wait, let's talk to the people actually writing code on the project first, right? Let's, let's talk to them. Let's see what their challenges are. Let's see where they get stuck. Let's see what they like already, what they can do very well. And then let's go ahead and do that. And lo and behold, after we did that, we completely re-architected the whole system, right? We, we completely upended what we thought we would need to do. And once we understood those challenges, it also led to further technical innovation. I invented compiler tooling, you know, on, on that team that, that can trace, you know, quadrillions of function calls in near real time alongside, you know, the program that's going, in, going on um, on a machine. So. That technical innovation did end up happening, but what really mattered was the value that it added to the folks working on the teams, right? That, that's what really matters at the end of the day. Um, and so you're absolutely right in that sense of technologists really need to, 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 to expand their horizons and do things that they really don't think, or stereotypically, they don't think they should be doing, right? Because that's, that's where we're, we're going to see value. As a matter of fact, actually, slight pivot in topic, but... This brings me back to language a little bit. You know, I, I mentioned I've already, I already mentioned that I'm interested in language, but I'm also really interested in psychology. And I'm even more interested in the intersection of the two, linguistic psychology, right? Because I feel like language fundamentally conveys so much more meaning than we give it credit for. For example, artificial intelligence. I do not like it when we call technology artificial intelligence, at least not yet. And the reason I say that is because Artificial intelligence is very subjective, and it's not true, right? It's not intelligence at all. It's only artificial. It's not intelligence whatsoever. You know, the machines today that, that uh, recognize your voice and, and, and respond to you, like Siri, right? They're not intelligent. They're doing literally mathematical pattern matching to try and identify what you said, right? There, there is no resemblance of intelligence going on. It's just that the task happens to look like it requires intelligence. Now, the thing is, when we have the exact same technology, 
right? So the exact same math, the exact same algorithms, but we put it on a watch and we do fall detection. <laughs> nice. Uh, so the Apple Watch does fall detection, right? So when we put the exact same machine learning, put it on a watch and do fall detection, we stop calling it AI, we call it machine learning. Just cool. because it doesn't look like it requires intelligence, that task, right? It's so, a bot. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I don't like when we call it AI. Sim because, because I feel like what we call it really has an imprint of what we think about it in our, in our heads. Similarly, there's the word digital transformation, yeah. right? And that's something that I know you're, you, you passionately, passionately dislike, the term digital transformation. Could you maybe tell me a bit more about why and what you think it should really be called? Yeah, absolutely. And matter of fact, it's not what we call it. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. I'd like it to be matured to something else. Mm -hmm. If you were to look up the definition of digital transformation, you'll see a lot of plethora of, of explanations. But they all boil down to something like, let's digitize something we're doing. Or I love, let's jump to the cloud, the new tool, <laughs> which is not new, but it's new to some. And they think that's digital transformation. And and I'm not sure they understand, unless you add a value to it or something to it, it's nothing more than applying, as I said earlier, digital capabilities to a manual process. You've made the paper electronic. Mm -hmm. And have you really made it better? Well, I've made it faster, but have you really improved it? Or have you simply set us on a status that says, it's still manual, I just do it on a keyboard instead on paper. Uh, or I go to the cloud with the same technology stack I have on-prem. Did I gain anything or did I just change the purchase side from one group to another? I would like to consider the maturation, now this is my term, okay, the maturation of digital transformation being technical enablement. Uh, how can technology make us better? Now, I don't mean make things easier, make us better. Do things that we do better. You know, it's interesting, we talk about robotic, uh, some of the, the, the robotic surgeries. And you know, it's not really robotic surgeries. <laughs> There's still a person doing it remotely, doing the surgery somewhere else, okay? What if it was truly robotic? What if these functions were so commonplace that the surgery could be done with such precision, better than a human could do, that is enablement. I've made it better for the person. I've made it safer for the person. And I think we start looking at ways to make digital be better for humans, be better for us. It's not replacing us, it's making us better. And I think that's what I can convert it to. Mature to digital, from digital transformation to technical enablement. And you're doing it now. You talked about language skills. Why is that important? Because it's how we talk. Then why do I have to have a different methodology to talk to a system? Today, I do it through code. Great. What's the next step? How do we move to something that's more efficient? Mm -hmm. uh, you and I have covered more things here. Can you imagine trying to digitize this communication between two systems? <laughs> It, it's not possible today, yeah. not without months of, cons, of of coding. So I'm saying consider transformation to enablement. Wow, that is, I, I love what you said there because there's just so much, there's so much value in, 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 in what you said, right? Because just transformation for the sake of transformation doesn't mean anything, right? If you're going to take exactly what you have on prem and literally copy and paste that code to a bunch of bare metal servers on AWS, it doesn't make sense. But then if I you move the location, that's all I've done is move the location. <laughs> and who you're paying. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but then if you start to say, well, maybe I could deploy an, uh, an OpenShift cluster. Maybe I could install IBM Cloud Pack for data on here. Maybe I could use these services. And maybe instead of having this custom solution, I could use this open source. Like if you start to, to, to genuinely evolve your stack to add value, even evolution for the sake of it doesn't make sense. But if you, if you evolve and you gain value from it, like for example, increased reliability and uptime, or decreased cost, or you know, only being able to pay for, for compute when you need it, these sorts of things, when you gain that value, then the, the, the enablement, th then it makes sense. That, that's when it becomes enablement, right? So- Agreed. I will tell you, let me throw one other topic at you too. So build into that, you said it yourself, you just said you hit on a really important topic. It is build in the resilience. The human body's designed to fight infection. 
Okay. Yes. It's designed to overcome something before it actually hurts you. Okay. Build a technology stack that's not only resilient, they're proactive resilient. It's actually looking for things going to hurt it and it's going to resolve that so the issue is never and never becomes a problem. You're going to have, listen, I, I tell people, it's not if it breaks, it's when. <laughs> okay? yeah. I've not had any technology in my life that has been foolproof. From a code perspective, infrastructure perspective, makes no difference, they're all intertwined. Build something that is allowed itself to heal and it actually makes itself better. If you can do that as a it, that elegant part of development, it works, but it works even during difficulty. Uh, I think that's where the strength's going to be. That is, you're right, because I feel like we are starting to see a shift towards technology that is fundamentally more resilient, but I don't think we're, we had that proactive resilience that you talked about, right? Like today's version of resilience, as, as you mentioned, is like, okay, instead of just having a single server, we've got a, a Kubernetes cluster with all these different pods running their own servers that people are being redirected to. If five of the pods go down, you've still got 10 to go, right? Like it, it's, it, and then there's like rolling updates and things like this, but, but, but the proactive resilience isn't built in. And I feel like that's where more complex technology, like machine learning power tech, like Dark Trace or Watson for cybersecurity, these things come in. And I feel like that would be, uh, that, that's, that's really interesting. I, I can't wait to see where we can advance technology for more reactive, resili proactive resilience there. And don't, don't, uh, don't automatically assume that monitoring is being it's truly monitoring because in some cases monitoring is just logging logs i know what happened so instead of trying to resurrect the dead i'd like to save the patient so uh in many times we say well i've monitored and i've alerted but have you allowed the technology to say this is how i'm going to fix it by the way that technology is available today for a lot of systems but it's not automatically built in i'm telling technologists build something of value that has lasting value mm -hmm. it goes well beyond just the did it work did it work even when I really needed it to work? Just wow. like you and Yes. And, and again, as I mentioned, even in the beginning of our conversation, right, where we're coming back to it, it's that innovation at the bottom of the stack affects everything on top of it. If you have even programming languages that encourage you to write safer, better code, you're going to have safer, better applications that are able to recover from their errors, right? Why did we go from just having pointers in C where anything can happen anywhere? You can corrupt any, any direction. You know, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do, right? Nothing's going to stop. Well, there are some safeguards in place, but ignoring that, you know, you, you can easily corrupt memory. You can easily do these sorts of things Absolutely. with undefined behavior, right? Why did we go from that to, let's just say, Java, where that where we at least have exceptions, right? And then why did we move from that to languages like Swift, where everything is safe, right? All right. the way from type conversions to optionals, making sure you don't unwrap data that doesn't exist, um, to runtime, you know, uh, th thread safety enforcement, and then we have languages like Golang that are doing runtime-based race condition checking, all these different things. So innovation at this level of the stack, it doesn't seem like it, but that's going to enable developers to work towards that kind of, as you mentioned, resilience where we say, let's save the patient instead of res resurrecting the dead, right? That's, that's, that's more difficult. <laughs> so. Our, our goal should be to make it so the service never dies in the first place. <laughs> so and don't don't stay with current technologies. If it doesn't exist, then partner with people develop that technology that does. Yeah. Be cautious not to be locked into the common. Very very good point. I will say actually, one thing that I that maybe a good example of that would be, you know, everybody today uh, seems to be. Um, I wouldn't say everybody, but the vast majority of even the enterprise market is like, oh, x86 is obviously the CPU architecture that we want to use because everybody is. But well, of course. Then, <laughs> but then you don't realize that hmm, maybe my specific application actually works better on Power or on ARM or on even Z. People are, you know, for so many years now, people have been saying the mainframe is dead but it's never dead, right? There, there's still fundamental advantages that you cannot get on other architectures. It's, it's, it's actually one of my- it's hybrid. Do what works where it works best. Exactly. Use right. the hammer for hammer, screw up for screw, yes. and screw up and don't assume they're kind of right. Just because- Combination. Yes, just because x86 is a brand new hammer doesn't mean you lose the Z screwdriver. You're still gonna be using it for something, right? It's valuable. Right? It's, even down to a technical perspective, it's one of the only complex instruction set uh, chips 
that doesn't use microcode. Like it uses a risk-based way of executing instructions that's really fast while having a complex instruction set. It's, it's, it's amazing the stuff that this architecture does. And people might miss out on that for their application if it happens to help them just because they think, Everybody else is using x86. I should be using it too, right? That doesn't necessarily make sense. Use the tools that are right for the job. Well, and the one thing I'll say, I know we're getting close to our end here, is, mm -hmm. you know, you may have multiple vehicles, and they serve different purposes. I mean, if you love driving fast, you need a Porsche. But if you're moving dirt, you need a bulldozer. But a Porsche is a very poor bulldozer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, a bulldozer is not very fast. But thank goodness we have both tools in the toolbox. Yeah. And those are extremes. But one would question, why would I think one tool or one infrastructure or one methodology is mm -hmm. always the case? When that gets developed, everything changes. Mm -hmm. That's not been developed quite yet. <laughs> right. So, so using the right tool for the job is always important. Now, before we end today, we've had a really nice discussion, by the way, and there's still more that I want to ask you. But now I want to go ahead and ask you some questions from the audience. Uh, we've got yes. a lot of really interesting questions. <clears throat> And I want to start off uh, by asking you a question from, uh, let's see over here, the question I believe is from Tassin. Um, yes, so humans uh, do, the question is, so, so humans make mistakes. What are some of the mistakes you've made in your career uh, as a technologist that you don't want the next generation to make? I may, I have made, I've, I've told myself I've had glorious failures. Uh, <laughs> the one thing that I, and I, I can go in specifics, uh, I've had the opportunity to fail in front of the president of the company, of the largest company on earth. Uh, failed very visibly, as a matter of fact, because I made some assumptions. I made some assumptions that certain file sets were in place and they weren't. And it was very visible to the customer base, which was standing in lines outside of the store. I thought the pricing was set properly for an entire store and I was wrong. Uh, that was in the early stages of uh, barcode scanning and that file had not been created to the level it needed to be. So I made assumptions. So I'm telling people, uh, don't do what I did, learn from what I learned. Don't make the assumptions. Have some assurance that things are right before you pull the trigger. But the most important thing is learn from your failures. There's very few failures that are actually uh, going to end your career. Matter of fact, the people often look at how you overcome failure as a true strength. And by the way, if you're going to make a, if you're going to have a mistake, try not to repeat it. Uh, but, uh, have look and what i'd say is have new areas to fail within but always to follow a leader said one time always fall forward uh, learn from what you've had a mistake on and uh, which caused your issue and then continue advancing don't ever stop moving forward don't let anything break your your uh, your your positive positive motivation Wonderful, thank you. That's that's such a meaningful message. Um, also, another question from Akash. He's asking, what should the mindset of students be while learning new technologies? And just he's adding to that, um, as in, I want to contribute and innovate and not just reinvent the wheel. So, what should the mindset of students be while learning new technology? Without being an irritant to your professor, okay, uh, don't be afraid to ask why. Okay. Never be a matter of fact, and don't ask why just once. Now, some p teachers find that very irritating, so pick the ones that it doesn't, but because you don't affect your grade. But I will tell you, be very uh, inquisitive. If someone says, this is how we do it, ask, why is that the best way? Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's a term I've used for years, and I, it's almost a misuse of the term, but I've used it anyway. It's a religious term. It's the study of hermeneutics, okay? Hermeneutics uh, at its basis is understanding, you know, languages, but, but uh, I actually use it in a little different in me, in the business side, questioning the obvious. Okay. It's one or two things will happen. Either by questioning the obvious, you'll either strengthen your resolve or you'll question the current state, both of which are positive. So I'm telling you study the, how things are done, but don't be afraid to ask why they're done that way. And if the answer is still, not very well prepared, ask it again a different way. If it's not a good answer, you have to question, is it actually the right way? So I'm asking students to think, don't think inside the box or outside the box. Why is there a box? Mm -hmm. So be inquisitive. Wonderful. Thank you. Everybody says, think outside of the box, right? But you got to ask, why is there the box in the first place? <laughs> yeah. Right? And, and sort of try, try and disambiguate what that box really is. 
Right. So another question, actually, again, from Tassin, he's asking, being a technologist is, is, well, he said it's the most challenge. Uh, okay. So, oh, sorry. No, I, I misunderstood the question. He's actually asking, being a technologist, what is the most challenging thing that you faced in your entire career? The realization that technology by itself may not be the end. You need to, and I mentioned a moment ago, you have to have something that demonstrates the value because I've had some really cool technology ideas. I mean, that I thought were just revolutionary until I tried to put on paper what it does. And people say, why would I want to fund that? Uh, or why do I want to make that real? Well, it's really cool. I understand that, but it doesn't gain us anything. I think the realization came to, you have to make, to be a truly successful technologist, student or otherwise, you have to start thinking, how does it help? And then be able to articulate that in a way that people come along the pattern, come along that pattern behavior with you. Uh, don't be afraid to question, but mainly don't be afraid to innovate. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would move that direction. Wonderful. Thank you. And also, Shiva is asking, well, we did talk a little bit about, about digital transformation, right? Whatever whatever that means. Um, and and <laughs> Shiva is asking, what are the challenges of this digital transformation that you find among people related to acceptance and access? So in terms of when people want to you know, evolve. Let's just say we're not even talking about digital transformation. Let's talk about the actual enablement. When you know that people are working towards, uh, I'm going to actually, so I'm slightly modifying Shiva's question, but I believe this is what we, what she meant, right? When people are working towards um, evolving technology for adding value, what are some of the main challenges um, that you find uh, uh, related to acceptance of the technology and access to that technology? And actually, I think that it goes two directions, but they're both based on the same thing opinions mm -hmm. and i think many people form opinions and they'll stick with that opinion even if it's not logical or even okay. if it doesn't make sense and by the way that's both their opinion and mine we talk about people gaining uh, additional insight and changing their minds to move to a, a more transformational model in this case i talk about enablement but you have to be able to be in a position that you are willing to accept a new idea and maybe your idea wasn't the best and the same thing without someone feeling degraded, how was theirs not the best, but together we found a better solution. Mm -hmm. It's not who wins, it's we win or we lose. By the way, we're all on the same team. Every person on earth is on the same team. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to survive, we're trying to be better, we're trying to improve, we're trying to continue down the path of evolution. Uh, in this case, we talk about digital transformation. How can we together come to a better solution? It's not who wins, it's how we win. And that's, I think, the biggest thing to overcome. Sometimes you have to be able to decide what's right instead of who's right. Mm -hmm. You're, that, that makes so much sense to me, right? The fact that everybody at the end of the day in the world is on the same team. I feel like not enough people realize that actively, right? It's easy to, it's easy for a lot of people to listen to that and be like, yeah, of course, we're all, we're all people. But then when, when you really think about it, the world isn't a zero sum game, right? It, it, it's not like, you know, you have more, so I have less. That's not how it works today, right? In, in, I mean, then again, back hundreds of thousands of years ago when our brains evolved, that's unfortunately how it was. If you gave somebody else some resources, you wouldn't have them. <laughs> so our, our brains are hardwired to think that way. So it's gonna take some effort, some conscious effort to really work towards not thinking that way. But I feel like when we do, we can really innovate technology but use that to add value. We can really add value to lives when we when we when we do that. You do the knowledge is the only thing you can pass on that when you give it away, you don't lose it. That is that's really nice to think about. That that I think that's a wonderful quote. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote that. Right? Knowledge is knowledge is knowledge is the only thing that we can that we can give away without having lost it. That that's that's so that's so insightful to think about. Right. It, it, I think I feel like that actually ties well into the message of you know the fact that the world isn't a is a zero sum game again. It, it's a different message, but it, it fundamentally means the same thing, right? If we if we were to go ahead and, and um, invest in um, like if if someone in Canada were to invent something, it's not like that's only going to affect or add value to people living in Canada, right? At the end of the day, that technology is going to go everywhere. That's exactly why we have such amazing technologies like open source today, right? If somebody from Ukraine or Africa or, or some country in Africa or, or Australia or someone from North America or South America could easily commit whatever code they wanted to the Linux kernel. And it's benefiting everybody in the world. Right? Right. That, is, that is amazing to think about. 
Uh, now, there are two more questions I see from the live stream that unfortunately aren't incredibly related to today's conversation, uh, but that I do want to quickly cover. Um, these questions are from, uh, first of all, Akash. Akash is asking me about one of my uh, other projects called Heart ID. Uh, what machine learning language did I use? I had used Python and Swift um, on, um, on the Nimbix uh, Jarvis cloud uh, to build that project, uh, as well as a question from Tushar, who's asking, I want to know how a compiler works since I'm a web developer. Developer. Um, there will be more content on my YouTube channel soon for that. Uh, and I will also go ahead and put a link in the uh, comments of this video. I'll tag you, put a link in the comments of the video with some more resources where you can go ahead and learn compiler tech. So Tushar, look out for that. And Tanmay, I will tell you that uh, I've been reading your book on Swift, by the <laughs> way. And uh, the compliment I'll give you, it's even understandable by those individuals that are well tainted with age. So thank you for making not only for the youth, but for those individuals that have uh, had experience that puts them into the paradigm model of not understanding all new things. That one's well read. So well read. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. That's my, that's my goal. Regardless of age, you could be really young. You could be, you know, you, you could be really experienced. I, I just want everybody to be able to, to, to be able to leverage that content and be able to learn about the world of, of new tech. Quick last question before we end today. This one's from uh, Hrishka on the live stream. Um, they're asking, do you think we'll be embarrassed by the technology we have today when we look back on it in the future, say, five years? And I think you might have a... Uh, uh, I think you might have a little uh, something to show us about uh, related to that question that you were showing me before the live stream. Remember the iPod? Oh, I do have that. <laughs> yeah, remember. As a matter of fact, I hope we are embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I hope we are just amazed at how little we understood because advancements. I hope it doesn't take five years. Mm -hmm. uh, because if not, I'll be sorely disappointed. I'm kind of looking, my, my, my grandchildren are embarrassed by the technology that I still use that, that, you know, they said, Dad, we're well past that because of my comfort level. But I'm looking forward to have, being embarrassed by our technologies because I'm looking for young minds which aren't tainted by paradigms to find the solutions. But I'll tell you, so I found this and it was in a drawer and I was actually amazed that it actually still worked. Right? And I shared it with you. But I, most people, I show this some people, and I might as well show them something from from another planet. I found an iPod, the old square iPod. Uh, and I said, well, that's unique. And I, I like to never found the charger, which was a wide charger. And, uh, and it charged. And when I went to it, it still works. And it still has all the videos. And now remember, it's not a touch screen. It's a rotation <laughs> screen. Uh, uh, but I was amazed this technology, number one, still worked. That gives you some idea how well it was created. But number two, I look at it now and I said, this is super antiquated on today's standards. Super antiquated. But yeah. when this came out, this was beyond revolutionary. Uh, but it was put in the hands of children. <laughs> and now one the children, the child that I bought this for was a young child, is now an astro engineer. You understand? And I'm looking what he's going to develop. He shared with us he's done, and he's my child. He's an astro engineer. And what he's doing is making things that I'm thinking of even more antiquated than what I was dreaming. So I'm saying dream big because things are going to be amazing in five years. Wow. Uh, I, I will say, you know, the, the iPod was, was revolutionary in that it lets you put uh, – how many, how many thousands of songs do you think you could fit on that uh, on that Thousands? Album? It was more like – Hundreds. Oh. <laughs> Even now I'm overestimating. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was no thousands, at least not on this one. But uh, I haven't checked this, the actual capacity of this, but I think it is maxed out and there's not much on here, by the way, uh, when I compare it to the storage on this or the storage or anything else I have. Yeah. But remember, this was before the time of some of the micro storage we have today. Wow. You know. Incredible. And and actually, to exactly your point in the beginning of our conversation, right, what if we can stop having to put everything locally and outsource to the cloud? You could fit a couple hundred songs on that one. You can fit thousand, 50 million on this device because you don't need them on the device, right? You can easily just access Apple Music in the cloud and suddenly 50 million songs that you can play. Well, instead of saying millions, say, I just want them all. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I want the Library of Congress at my fingertips. Well, you have it now. Wow. Now, I want it at speed, different discussion. I want it to be read to me as I drive. Absolutely. I want it embedded directly into my skull. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, uh, really quickly, um, this is a really interesting question, so I'm going to take a minute to quickly ask you this. This is, um, I'm not even sure if this is something anybody can answer, but the question is, what is the upper limit of the software industry? <laughs> <laughs> and this question I will say is, this. this I, I is, think the sorry. upper limit, uh, I, I don't think that's answerable because that's almost like saying, what's the largest number? Yeah. That's... You know, what you could say is, at what point in time does the intelligence of a, of a technology supersede the ability of its creator? Now, I don't think we're going to see that, yeah. at least not in my lifetime. But I think we'll see what value can it add to its creator. What additional strengths does it give you? I think when it comes to the point, and it's almost there now, when it's so commonplace, it's just normal. Mm -hmm. That we've added enough value to say that question's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I think that we'll be in a position to say the upper limit of software. I'm saying, what's the upper limit of the capability of the people to build it? And I yes. think with every generation, it's going to change. Yeah. And thank yeah. goodness it does. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I feel like maybe um, a good way to think about it is that software as we define it today, may have an upper limit, right? It may, we, we might be able to say, we physically cannot create processors with a smaller size than three nanometers, otherwise electrons are gonna tunnel through the gates, right? And, right. <laughs> and then at that point, we fundamentally cannot run instructions faster than this certain limit, and so software is a limit. But humans aren't just going to keep the same. Light, the light is a constant. Yeah, no. exactly. Yeah, exactly. But humans aren't just going to keep the same software and the same hardware forever. We're going to fundamentally change what it means for software to exist with things like quantum computing and so many other kinds of computing that we have now. We're changing what it means. So every time we start to reach a limit, not only do we innovate to push that limit further, but rather to redefine what that limit means. So maybe that's not the... Um, not a, a good way to phrase the question, but you're right, Mike. Uh, maybe it's more of what is the limitation of the human being writing the software rather than the limitation of the software itself. Right. Now, another qu really quick question, actually, from Tassin. How can we get in touch with you? Oh, well, of course, <laughs> uh, I would encourage you, by the way, because I tell an empowered technologist, a powerful technologist, is I use a lot of LinkedIn. It's mm -hmm. easy. It actually demonstrates people's experiences, and if you have an interest, that's an easy way to contact me. Uh, that's the best one I can think about. We'll just use LinkedIn, and all my contact information is out there. Uh, now, there's more than one Mike Tibbs, you understand, but uh, just Google me. You'll be able to see which one is me. So. Wonderful. But, the, the other Mike Tibbs is my son. Obviously, you'll be able to tell the difference. <laughs> all right, well. Facial recognition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another technology we could talk about later too. Yeah, by the exactly. Way. <laughs> right, and also, uh, let's see over here. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention. Sorry, the last question about the upper limit of the software industry. Um, that question was from SS on YouTube. So thank you for sending that question in. Right uh, now, Mike, uh, we've had a we've had an amazing conversation today. I've I've, I've learned a lot from this, and. I, you know, we, we have a really diverse audience joining us today. We've got all sorts of folks joining in. We, you know, we, we've actually got questions from students and people in business and people in, you know, tech and, and all these sorts of folks. Based off our discussion, what is a final message that you want to share with everybody on the stream today? On a more uh, tactical answer to that, I'm going to ask you, most people on this list are, are technologists either creating technology or empowering technology. I'm going to say, regardless build, create, or generate things that can be supported. Uh, be cautious not to build things that are so specialized that when they fail, they're considered a failure. Okay, so that goes back to the zooing side. But mainly for the technology itself, build yourself. I'm gonna ask you to consider, all of you to consider doing something outside of your normal comfort zone. You may be very comfortable in front of a keyboard and may be very, very capable regardless of your age. I'm asking you to try something outside of that, outside of your area of expertise, well beyond that. I remember some of our greatest relationship items were generated laughing at a uh, museum art piece. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, again, that built a relation between you and I, but from that has spawned several very, very, very deep conversations. Uh, consider a mental or physical activity that takes you outside of your comfort zone and expand your horizon and say, how can I apply the technologies I am very gifted at working with to improve the human condition or improve business or just improve people? And by doing so, you are going to be on a never ending journey to make it better. And that's makes that that is the purpose most of us should have. Wow. Wow. That that's that, that, that gives us a lot of purpose as to as to you know why we're building this technology and, and, and what we should be doing with it. Thank you very much for sharing, Mike. It's been an it's been an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I, I will say, you know, again, I've learned so much from this conversation. I'm sure everybody in the audience has as well. We got some great questions in. Um, and uh, of course, if there are any questions that we weren't able to answer today, please do feel free to keep them in the comments and Mike and I will go ahead and get back to you on those as well. Uh, now, once again, the series is held uh, every Sunday in the morning Eastern time. So make sure you join us next week. I gave you a little bit of a hint. We're going to be talking about something language related. All I can say is it's going to be really technical, really fun. We're going to be getting into a lot of details. Uh, so make sure you join us next week as well. And so once again, thank you very much, Mike. Honored to have you on the show today. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining the stream today. And goodbye. Have a beautiful day.